Hey everyone, my name is Mike Vaughn. I'm a writer for Geek Vibes Nation, and I'm also the author of The Ultimate Guide to Strange Cinema. And I'm Dylan Gonzalez. I'm the editorial director for GeekVibesNation.com and also a co-host of the Home Dance Film Festival podcast. And welcome to a new Video Attic new release roundup. Uh, if you're new here, well, first of all, welcome. Uh, what we do is we go back and forth uh, talking about the latest home video uh, reviews. And uh, I know I say this every week, but we have a wild, wild ranging variety of titles uh, mm -hmm. to talk about. But I'm going to kick it off to you to start us off. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm going to take us on a roller coaster, but I'm going to start <laughs> off kind of gentle, um, gentle enough. Uh, this is from uh, G Kids and Shout Factory. It is a new anime film, New Gods, uh, Yang Jin. Uh, if I butchered it slightly, I apologize. I tried to go as best as I heard on the track. <laughs> um, so uh, this uh, is, I believe, the second in an ongoing series of like New Gods films uh, where they kind of uh, tackle... Chinese mythology and uh, like tell these stories that are very big in China. This comes with Blu-ray and DVD. It's a combo pack um, and it comes with a fold-out poster, which I'll show off real quick. Uh, not a direct replication of the front artwork. It's a little hmm. bit different. It's a little minimal, but pretty cool. Uh, so I uh, the first film, I believe it's called Niza. It's N-E-Z-H-A. Um, and I have not seen that film. I actually just kind of jumped in with this one, which I believe is kind of set as a prequel. But I think like I watched this one and I wasn't confused about what's going on. Um, but this one is it's uh, if we have any uh, viewers from China, they'll be w way more versed in this uh, like uh, mythology than I am. But the best that uh, I picked up from this movie is uh, this uh, Yang Jin, the central character. He is a uh, a godlike figure who has a uh, like a powers of like a a third eye, like a literal third eye, but like like a big like also kind of like a uh, not figurative, but kind of just like. Uh, not just like a literal third eye, it's like tapping into like the powers like uh, beyond. Um, but so that eye has been closed for several years just due to some like trauma that he uh, had, uh, went through. And he had like, there's the way that it's uh, told in the movies, I don't want to reveal everything, but uh, about six or seven years prior, he had like, imprisoned his sister under a mountain and now his nephew is like trying to get get revenge on him and like try to seek him out to get revenge for his mom uh but then as you get go through the story you realize maybe not everything is as it seems and you kind of get these uh this journey of like a yang jin who is trying to kind of live a normal life at this point uh, when we meet him um and then all of kind of his past comes like back to haunt him and he's kind of has to like try to once again reopen his third eye and i uh, kind of uh clean the slate of what like all he's been accused of in the past and just set all that aside so basically what this is um a lot of these films and uh like there's like a ton of films that are just huge in china that like most nor like the average american won't know about but they are just like they'll make more than most pretty much any movie that'll be in the U S and this, this is like one of those types of movies where uh, Chinese mythology is like uh, so like in demand there. It's like their Marvel basically where, uh, and this is, you can kind of treat this as like an animated Marvel film almost. Cause there's like big action set pieces, larger than life, like it's like feats of danger and everything. It's like, it's not grounded in reality, obviously. Um, but uh, it's just like huge set pieces, but like action packed fights, crazy creatures, like hulking figures. It's just everything is thrown into this. There's a lot of like really interesting characters. Um, and overall, like as like an average American, um, I, I found it very entertaining, like without having that extra backstory. Um, I found it just to be like a pretty entertaining movie. I had heard, and the reason I hadn't really sought out the first movie 
I thought it might kind of be be kind of like jingoistic, like Chinese, like propaganda type, like at least with the first movie. But I'm glad I took a chance on this because it isn't really like I think it's like it's entertaining for like a, a wide audience, like wider than I, I would have believed. Um, and uh, I talked about an a, uh, anime film a few weeks ago that I wasn't quite on board with, even though I liked the story, the digital animation was not my favorite and it kind of like kept me at like an arm's length. This is digitally animated, but it's actually like a much higher quality. It's a really like beautifully animated film. It's not like photorealistic or anything, but it's just like really well done digital animation. This is, you can tell this is a production they put like more time and effort into. Um, and so it's like really beautiful animation, which did not take me out of the story. It enriched it. And um, this release comes with the original uh, Mandarin dub and then our Mandarin, original Mandarin and an English dub. Uh, I obviously uh, always advocate for the original language, but if you are, maybe you get have like some young kids or something who like are kind of, you'll want to like ease them into anime. There is an English dub to kind of like until they can start reading like on that level. Um, but uh, overall, really entertaining movie. This uh, Blu-ray comes with about a 16 minute interview with the director, uh, another 17 minute uh a uh, series of interviews with the actors and a 13 minute like kind of news special where they like like I noticed a lot with a lot of these anime films they treat their, their like film productions a lot differently over there they have like really big press conferences that are huge deals and everything and, like run like primetime specials to announce things there's kind of like one of those things there's like a 13 minute special uh, that they included in here along with some trailers and everything so overall uh, New Gods Yang Jian uh, it's a pretty solid anime, and I recommend it if you're kind of interested in Chinese mythology. I want to seek out the first one now, and then there is like a mid-credits like teaser of like there's another one coming soon, so I'll be on the lookout for that probably next year when we get it. Nice. Yeah, I know you are a resident uh, anime expert. Um, so um, having said that, uh, do you feel like the series uh, as a whole, do you think is like a good primer for people that are maybe kind of new or newish to anime? Um, I think it's, I think it's so far, it seems like a pretty good starting point, especially if you are kind of more so uh, you want something that has a, like a little bit of like humor, a little bit of action, just like it's, it's more, it seems like a well-rounded property instead of like, there are certain animes, like some of the classic ones that are more gentle and people might find them much like a little bit boring if they're not used to like kind of the rhythms of the, the, the dramas. But if you're kind of more so like want kind of like a audience friendly, like mainstream appeal type thing, this seems kind of that. It seems like kind of made for like more mass consumption. Nice. That's awesome. Well, I am very new to anime, so I will have to check out that series. Um <laughs> I don't know what a good segue is for my next title. So we're just, we're going to oil up. We're going to jump right in. Ooh. Um, oh, it, yeah. I think, I think you know what I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah. going with this. Uh, Magic Mike's Last Dance. Mm -hmm. um, and there's the back. Um, we do have some nice featurettes, which I always appreciate from Warner Brothers. Uh, Slipcover. Um there so um yours will have a digital copy if you order this it's just not in there right now um so i am new to the magic mike um franchise um in fact i messaged you and was like can you catch me up because i don't know i don't necessarily think that it, it's a deep well of mythology that you need to you know mm -hmm. have established um but yeah uh I watch with my with my husband and he um we both kind of had the same reaction which was yeah, it's fine. <laughs> uh, so I'll go into a little more detail. Um mm -hmm. yeah, I think like I've definitely seen um a bunch of dance movies and this kind of feels like a pretty standard dance movie drama. You have the typical like uh they're going to shut down our show and we're gonna you know do one last hurrah and 
Um, I actually do like how they sort of could, they sort of do subvert that in a way, but I won't say because I don't want to spoil it. But um, yeah, I think that um, the dancing, of course, is really good. I think the plot is compelling enough to to keep me engaged. I think it was maybe a little bit too long, if I'm being honest. I feel like there were some things that could have been um, a little bit more like consolidated and concise, but. Yeah, overall, it was good. Um, Selma Hayek is awesome, and she can still get it, and amazing. Uh, no notes. <laughs> um, you know, Channing Tatum is Channing Tatum, so that's good if that's your thing. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you've seen this, right? Yes, I have a lot of thoughts, but whenever I do get around to talking about it, I'll try to keep it brief. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. Uh, we'll chime in if you want us to do a Magic Mike special episode. We'll just we'll completely <laughs> go off. Um, you know, maybe I'll get like a tearaway thing. It'll be a whole thing. Anyways. Um, no, it, it it's in reverse. They pay me to put clothes on. So no, for example, well. uh, <laughs> but. Yeah, this is a really nice release, though. I have to say, uh, I really liked the featurette. It was really nice. Um, we do get a deleted scene, which I don't want to spoil, but um, it's not that amazing. You can kind of see why it was cut. But yeah, um, I kind of would have loved the commentary track. You know, I'm a sucker for those. I love those. Um, but uh, this being a newer movie, it looked great, sounded great. Of course, you know, this is a very uh, musical forward uh, film. So I think you do get a really nice quality um, from the Adobe uh, audio uh, track. So, yeah, um, overall, really good. Um, the movie was fine. Um, it was certainly not bad. I just, it's kind of what you expect. So, yeah. You know. <laughs> okay, here are my thoughts. I will try to keep it brief since it is not my title and I don't want to like make this go on forever. First, um, so just a little bit of context. I, I mentioned every week I'm the co-host of the Home Dance Film Festival podcast. We have covered the first Magic Mike on our show, and I'll drop that episode link in our in the in the comment section so people can, or the description so people can listen to that. So I've seen all three films. I will say this is my least favorite of the three. I will say I, I love Steven Soderbergh who directed this. Um, I don't know how, but so, somehow he direct, directs my least favorite entries in this because my favorites are, uh, the second one's my favorite, then the original, and now this one. Um, what I really think was missing in this one, and you don't have this context because so you haven't seen the first two, is they pretty much completely eliminate all of his friends that he made from the first two movies. And the second one's more of a road trip movie, which is a lot of fun. Um, but this movie, uh, like you get to see them like on a really quick zoom call, but you don't really have a lot of like interactions with them. And what's so great about them is they have like such great, each individual personalities and all the dancers that Mike has to like gather in this one, there are no personality whatsoever, which like, if you, I love Channing Tatum, but just if you having him as like your only like source of like really like character work, he's not like the most compelling character in this universe. So like the fact that you like abandon all those other characters, not my favorite. And like his chemistry with Selma Hayek, I did not completely believe it. So I wasn't like completely on board for their romance and like just the whole like it just all felt off for me. I still enjoyed it somewhat, but. I don't know. Like the ending number was the best part for me. Mm -hmm. I just think it drug a lot in the middle. You mentioned the deleted scene. I actually did like that deleted scene because it like kind of fixed a problem that I had in the movie, which there was a scene where they were like, it was a dance scene and they were just starting to get going and they extend scene to kind of like abruptly cut it. And this kind of let it breathe a little bit for mm -hmm. me, yeah. which like just kind of like showed why why this was important within the plot and i was like why'd you cut this because this actually shows why that they were doing this in the first plot or point anyway but overall if you enjoy like i want you michael to at least watch the second one because it's a lot of fun but yeah. i i think this it was a letdown compared to what i wanted because the second one is so much fun i just think that they really needed some more interesting characters within this to really make this story work like as it did seem kind of bland overall for me except except for that opening number where he is like proving uh or like giving salma hayek 
her money's worth. Right. That was a very hot <laughs> scene. That was, uh, but yeah. other than that, it kind of goes down. It never quite hits those highs right that like are established right off the bat. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm very open to checking out all of them. Do you know, I don't think they do at this point, but do you think they have a plan to do like all three of them in a, like a set or something? Uh, I don't know. I, I would love to see them all on 4K. I know they probably won't do this now that they've released the Blu-ray for the newest one. I'd love to see at least the first two on 4K. They probably won't. But if you want to sample them at least, I'm pretty sure they're on HBO Max. So I would like recommend that. But like, I don't know. The second one especially is a lot of fun. I love road trip movies and like <laughs> you, but if you've seen this one, so you might as well go back and see the yeah. first two, but like the second one's where it really reaches its full potential for me, at least that's my opinion. I'll check them out. And if we get enough uh, love in the comments, we will do a magic mic uh, bonus episode. So yes. Going through the trilogy, like this is, <laughs> Yes, so uh, I'll keep things moving. Sorry, I had to uh, unleash my opinions on Magic Mike. Um, but uh, I'm going to a another new release. This is from Paramount. And this is the 25th season of South Park. <laughs> 25 seasons. This makes me feel hella old. <laughs> uh, but so, yeah, uh, you have recently talked about some of their specials that they've done. They've done like the covid post covid this is like the first actual season that they put out in a while there's no reversible art but it has all the episode titles this includes six episodes uh from the that are comprised the 25th season this i was looking at imdb and i was like oh where did this seventh and eighth episode go but then i realized it's a two-part special called the streaming wars and I know they're probably just going to put out another individual thing like I did for the COVID ones, which kind of annoys me. I just want them to just stop kind of milking this uh, property and just like kind of include it in here. But that being said, this like whenever we talked about post COVID a few months ago, um, we kind of both agreed that it just kind of like was kind of wearing out a little bit like the like they had like these really long episodes um, and it kind of like, it was just kind of, it wasn't South Park at its best. I think this is kind of a return to form. It kind of is more what I wanted. And I think it's really helped out by there are individual short episodes. So like those like 22 minute episodes where they can kind of focus in on one plot. There are a few strands that still kind of like are right, continue this season, but I like that they are kind of able to focus in more individual episodes. Um, there is, there are mentioned i know you had a problem with the integrity weed stuff on the the other episodes they do have that but they kind of go in a little bit of a different direction which i kind of like they're like i'll just kind of tease that randy starts to uh have to deal with um his uh white privilege and kind of how that kind of like uh figures into thing and he kind of like gets into some interesting situations this season uh they also make some uh like they have the the kids have to deal with pajama day and like kind of likening that to like uh like getting vaccines it's kind of like a really funny dichotomy of that like how people show support in different ways uh so there's a lot of really good things like individually in each episode like there's some jokes that of course don't land but like that's just the nature of south park but there's a lot of stuff that i really found myself laughing out loud at so i was like Yes, I, I'm enjoying South Park on that level again, so I really appreciate that. Um, as far as the, the release is concerned, audiovisual, it's what you expect from this series. It's clean, sounds good, it's a really good release. No special features, none. I don't know why they stopped doing that. Uh, they haven't done it the past few releases. Um, but if you want these, they're here. They're like all together, and I think it's fairly reasonably priced right now. Um, but if, if you're, if you've kind of grown a little bit weary of South Park, uh, in the past few years, at least sample it. Maybe I think it's like on Paramount plus or maybe HBO. I can't, I, they, they bounce back and forth between what episodes are on which platform. I would at least sample a couple and like, see if you want to own it. Cause I think it is like a pretty solid season of South Park. And I had a, I had a lot of fun, like spending time with them, which I couldn't quite say about the post COVID special. <laughs> yeah nice well i uh i admit i am behind on south park so that seems like a good excuse to 
kind of get caught up. So I'm I'm sticking with some recent releases here to start off with. Um, my next title is uh the infamous cocaine bear. <laughs> yes, and watch I, I watched this last night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so when I'm done, I'm I'm curious as to get your take on this, but uh packaging A plus uh Universal did a great job. I like the raised. That's pretty yeah. cool. Um so here's the back. Um we do get some um featurettes. Um they do a, a blooper reel, which I love. That's that and commentary tracks are my favorite. So yeah. And that's same as here's the inside. Um so uh like Magic Mike, uh this does have digital code that's just not in there right now. And uh yeah, so my thoughts. Um uh, <laughs> there was a lot of buzz around this movie because of course it's just like it's such a, a wild premise and it kind of reminded me of like the hype train around snakes on a plane um where that became came kind of a, a meme and stuff but um yeah it was fine the thing is it's a well-made film but it feels like a, a really great short film sort of stretched into feature mm -hmm. film length um it, it starts out great it has a lot of great energy um the cast is is fantastic margaret martindale I love her so much. And for, for fans of the American, this is kind of a mini reunion. Um, it's got no, no less than three actors from, from that series. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, but I think where this movie starts to fall apart is maybe in the second act and then kind of into the third act. Um, it definitely starts um, feeling the length of the film and, I think at a, a one point we like paused the movie, my husband and I, to see like that we had like a half an hour to go and <laughs> like, how is this movie still on? Um, but that's the thing. It's a great short film stretched out the feature film length. Um, that's not to discredit, you know, it is well made. It kind of reminded me of a fun, maybe bigger budget, like Grindhouse film, like Severin has put out a ton of, these amazing nature run amok movies like Grizzly and The Day of the Animals, a good one. Grizzly. Over 18 feet tall, over 2,000 pounds. The largest carnivorous brown beast in the world. June. Anyone is fair game. Because this grizzly preys on the easiest food of all, man. You know, then you start getting into the shark movies and then that's a whole other avenue. But anyways, you know, it kind of was akin to that. It felt like the filmmakers were trying to sort of tap into that. Um, I think one of the biggest glaring problems is the CGI bear is just super distracting. Like there's times when it looks fine and then there's times when i'm like it looks like i'm watching a video game cutscene. um it like i get like i think i appreciate the fact that they didn't use a real bear and you know that's not humane so i did like knowing that it was a cgi bear and it was fine but i just kind of wish it looked more realistic like it it sort of took me out of the fantasy a little bit but yeah it's fun it's a fun movie there definitely are a lot of like jokes that land really well um again everything with margo martindale was amazing i love her so much <laughs> um so what did you think uh i actually enjoyed it a lot more than you did i uh, i will add the caveat that after uh, my i watched this with my wife and uh, we both had a lot of fun with it we watched the trailer afterwards which we've gotten to a place in the past few years where we just don't watch trailers because they seem to ruin everything and we can understand that anyone who watched a trailer would probably be kind of underwhelmed by what they saw just because like they showed a lot of the best parts in the trailer we had not seen the trailer we had just heard about cocaine bear and like we had a lot of fun with it we thought it was like 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 this delivered kind of the campy quality that i felt personally for me was lacking in megan like i know we kind of disagreed on megan this was what i wanted it was just like <laughs> it knew its premise and they it went for it like there were bears like doing cocaine ripping people's limbs <laughs> off killing people people getting shot in the head like it just like gave me 
what I wanted from Cocaine Bear. And I just, I had a blast. Like, I didn't have really a problem with the CGI. I, yes, it, like, it could look better, but it didn't look bad to me. And I don't know, like, I, it was only like an hour and a half. So it didn't really feel that long to me. It kind of like, I could, yes, there was like, whenever they got near the end and they like really started kind of like, like the, when they got, I don't want to spoil stuff, but whenever they got near like the waterfall sequence, like it kind of slowed down a little bit. But other than that, like I had a lot of fun just from the first moments where Matthew Reese comes on and he's dancing around in the yeah. airplane. And <laughs> yeah. like, uh. I don't know. I was just like, okay, let's do this. And I don't know. I had, I, it, it just like gave, it, it had enough energy for me. Just, I don't know. I had a lot of fun with it. I think it delivered on its premise and it worked. I also was like, I, I, I could have sworn that for a second those kids were going to OD because they, they did like a lot of cocaine. <laughs> like, yeah. They had like a knife that was just like stacked this high and was just like. Well, and... they, they, they didn't snort it. They like ate it and they spit it out. Oh, right. So, that's like... right. That's right. So um... I was like, it's still not great, but they spit most of it out. So I'm like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Again, it's it's uh, <laughs> kind of a campy, silly movie. I will say. I mean, listen. I did definitely did not hate it. I I had fun with it. It definitely does deliver everything it promises. Um, because it's okay. You don't have to like it as much as me. It's we disagree all the time. It's okay. <laughs> no, I just don't want you to think that I absolutely hated it. I had fun with it. I. It's interesting because I don't know if you heard this, but apparently Ray Liotta's character was supposed to have a more maybe gruesome sort of outcome but mm. since this was maybe this and blackbird i believe were both his last projects um so i think out of respect they sort of like toned it down which if you've seen the, i mean you've seen the movie so it was already kind of intense um <laughs> yeah oh and the bear cubs that that was sad too so uh, um but yeah no it's fun um i think we are primed for a cocaine bear Megan crossover event. <laughs> uh, it, it, I don't no think cocaine bear for... stands a chance, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I would, I, I would pay money to see that though. Let's make it happen, <laughs> Universal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I and I, I, you're probably going to mention this, but I listened to the audio commentary track, which I'm glad mm. this included an in audio commentary, and I liked hearing like Elizabeth Banks just like like hearing Matthew Reese like calling her up and just being like you don't have anyone for this like a minute long role I want to like do this I want to like fly to Ireland and just like have this like silly moment before I die and just like do I was just like I just love that he's just like Elizabeth please put me in this movie <laughs> I want to be in Cocaine Bear yeah I I wish that they would like promote the commentary track because it's not on the back but mm -hmm. yeah I loved it it was it was fun watching it a second time to listen to the track it is uh, a blast um and again i just i love that they don't have scenes together like all three of them from the americans mm -hmm. but it it like made me excited that you know because i love that series i thought that was a really cool yeah um show so yeah awesome ah <sighs> cocaine bear what a what a treat uh <laughs> Moving on to my next title. I feel like I'm talking so much this episode. Um, this is from Cult Epics, and this is Amnesia, uh, which is from 2001. Uh, this uh, is a, a Dutch film. Um, and so here's a slip cover, and here underneath is the standard. And I believe... I mean, I'm sure it'll probably be around for a little bit, but this is like a limited edition with like this extra disc over here, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, which, uh, so the the reverse art is like the two films on the disc. There's Suzy Q and uh, I believe it's Dark Light. Yes, I, I don't speak uh, Dutch, but <laughs> there is a translation of Dark Light. Um, so that is reversible if you care to get this. Um, but fixating on amnesia for a second, I quite enjoyed this movie. Um, this uh, stars 
I'm not going to attempt to, attempt to say his name, but it's one of the leads of Speak No Evil, which I know you did a a, a, a YouTube video on uh, with Andre, I believe. Was, did you talk to Andre on that movie? I believe you did. Okay. Um, and and uh, so it's uh, him and Carice Van Houten uh, from Game of Thrones, uh, Melisandre, uh, uh, the, the Red Woman, I believe. Uh from Game of Thrones. So both of them are in here. And the the lead guy, he actually plays a dual role of like twins. Um, and he's like a haunted uh, photographer who goes back to care for his ailing mother, who is like also living with his brother and uh, takes his girlfriend played by Chris Van Houten uh, with him. And there's kind of like, uh, this is, he's kind of haunted by memories of the past. You kind of get flashes of this throughout the uh the movie and it's basically a tale it's like a little bit dreamy a little trippy and it's like uh, eventually kind of like leading to like just unearthing these memories from the past that he's like kind of like repressed trauma um it's a really uh it's like it's it's a mystery thriller but there's a lot of like dark comedy within it as well um uh, just like the dynamics between the brothers um and like just like some of the odd dialogue that is kind of spoken it's like it really kind of keeps you off kilter in a really interesting way um it's like just like kind of like uh kind of the dark humor of this like i'll just say like there's a scene where like there are some like some guests that are over who like really hate like someone who had like passed away and they are near his grave and like a man orders his wife to piss on this person's grave because they he hated them and the woman's like yeah it's just funny he's like no piss on his grave and she's like okay and you just see her like like hike up and like piss on the grave and i'm just like this movie's great i love it like this is it's like such like dark weird comedy but also like this mystery thriller aspect um it's like i said there's a lot of like i i don't want to give away i'll just say it's a really entertaining movie and i'm really glad we got this release um, cause it was not on my radar before this has, it comes from a new 4k, uh, restoration of the original camera negative. Um, it comes with a, uh, there's an intro from the director, uh, like an optional intro. Um, there's an audio commentary, uh, with the director and, uh, the lead, uh, star, the male lead star who plays the brothers. Um, and then there is another 46 minute interview with the director and Caris Van Houten um, that that it was it's newly filmed so that's pretty cool and then there's a 30 minute 38 minute making of uh, and then as I said this is the, the the limited edition with the extra disc which includes two extra movies two TV movies one's a um, 85 minute movie with uh, Caris Van Houten that which is her first appearance I think ever on screen um as well and then also another from the dark light uh is a 55 minute tv film um and both of those are in hd and i think overall it's a, a really nice package so you get like three movies in this package one's from 4k restoration then original camera negative a lot of great special features so it's just a really if you kind of like dark kind of nordic cinema like i with like some dark humor i highly recommend it yeah, that sounds great. Um, yeah, I love uh, dark humor. I love uh, all of that sounds amazing. Um, it's kind of funny because my next title very much seems akin to what you were talking about, um, which has these really weird moments. Um, not quite um, grave peeing, but you know, <laughs> other weird, plenty of other weird stuff. Um, yeah. And that is, um, um, gosh, and, and I just want to say that like Severin is quickly, it, it, I have always loved Severin, but I feel like they're increasingly becoming one of my favorite labels. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is um, Drowning by Numbers. And um, this weirdly was not on my radar, even though I'm a fan of the director. Um, mm -hmm. And holy crap, this is amazing. And it's maybe one of my new favorite discoveries. Um so here's the back. Um, as always, like Severin comes to play when they do their releases. Um, like they don't just 
shove a disc out uh it's always like top notch here's the inside um yeah this movie is weird it, it's just i don't know how else to describe it um it's a very strange like uh the whole sort of centerpiece is this like you know innocuous sort of older lady that drowns her husband and spends the rest of the movie sort of trying to get away with it but you know that's almost um secondary to just how kind of this whole uh town is just very weird and everything is just very off kilter it's not folk horror but i think if if you would see it you could you would you would kind of like get some of that folk horror flavor from it um but yeah it is a pitch black comedy um that's this whole movie's kind of vibe it's just a very weird you know characters are very quirky uh i i mentioned folk horror because a lot of their games a lot of their like like things that they do for fun almost feel uh ritualistic um so it just and you know having like a small kind of isolated town it gives you that kind of wicker man sort of feeling um so it's not horror but i feel like it does sort of have a folk horror flavor to it um and uh this has some of the most beautiful photography that i've seen uh in an older film um it's uh 1988 um just uh, the the outdoor um, cinematography, the way things are like shot and lit, it's just extraordinary. And we get a beautiful 4K, um, re you know, release for this, and I I really couldn't be happier. Um, and uh, if you're uh, a fan of this movie or you think this kind of sounds uh, up up your alley, um, I always I need to look up the title because I always butcher it because it's a long title. Uh, <laughs> Hold on one second. We can cut this. Um, do you know the one I'm talking about? Do you know this director? Yeah, it's Peter Greenway, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't actually seen any of his films, so I don't know. Okay. Um, hold on. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so if you think uh, you like this, might uh, like this movie, uh, the director also did uh, The Cook, The Thief, His Wife, and Her Lover uh <laughs> it's a long title uh, i didn't want to butcher it uh which not unlike the movie itself if you've ever <laughs> seen it you get that reference um but uh yeah i would love to see that in 4k but holy crap this was such a fun discovery and um support a label that puts out stuff like this because man that's that's amazing um i can't say anything else it's just check it out it's weird it's wonderful. Um, I think the only thing that I kind of didn't like about it is there is some fat phobia that's super gross. Um, but other than that, you know, it's it's good. It's just I love these really weird, dark comedies. Um, and that's very much in the director's kind of mode. So, yeah, very much worth checking out. Awesome. Uh, that one, I knew that it was coming out, but I've not seen it. Uh, so I'm very excited to check that one out. Uh, moving on to my next title. This is from VCI Entertainment and NBD. Um, this is The Green Hornet. Um, it's 13 uh, serialized episodes. Uh, it's just kind of like the, uh, like the uh, old, like, movie theater serials or that you would see so the two disc set of the 13 episodes um here is it does have reversible cover art so you have this here um so yeah um so 13 chapters that make up this story um so so anyone who's like familiar with these old serials it's just kind of like uh uh building like chapter after chapter chapter every week um so it's like the, anyone who's like knows like the green hornet and kato um like the unmasked hero who is like trying to take down like the criminal element um within, within his community um a lot there's like a nefarious plot bubbling underneath that he only he can like solve and uh take down the bad guy so it's like uh 
like a it's kind of like a batman situation but just kind of different um has a also has a cool car um so uh it's just like a classic serial where uh so it's just like a hero defeating the villains it's a really entertaining 13 chapters um i think it really it like there are kind of like it it does kind of feel stretched at points like throughout these 13 chapters um but nothing like too terrible um i don't think there's like too much filler um but overall i think this was a really fun adventure and this is a pretty solid release from bci i think they can be a little hit or miss miss sometimes i don't know what kind of restoration has been put forth there are some iffy elements but like overall i think it's a pretty solid transfer all things considered especially like since this is pretty old um and uh that sounds like the sound can be a little like uh like hissy or a little like hollow at times but even then not too bad like it's it's still perfectly audible and um uh you do even get some a few special features you get like um a couple of the a uh, couple of audio right radio shows and like an audio interview as well um and so yeah if you are a fan of like the old school serials i've seen like the superman ones before um this is my first time seeing the green hornet but i had a fun time with it i think these are like a really cool artifact from the past so i'm glad bci put these out on blu-ray because i think they deserve it yeah that's awesome I, um yeah it's a shame that we don't really seem to talk about much serials very much but i do really enjoy like what you know you were saying about the superman ones like what mm -hmm. they do put out um there was a really good one with um, Bela Lugosi, and I'm blanking on the the title, but uh, Rob Zombie kind of used some of the um, imagery from that. So uh, I'm going to stick with some of the older kind of uh, content here for my next title. And uh, this is one that I was really excited for because I haven't seen, but um, based on the director and the actor, I was really excited. And that is You and Me by Fritz Lang. And um, just the back. So Sylvia Sidney might not be somebody that like automatically you know of, but if you've seen uh, Beetlejuice, she is Juno the caseworker. Um, Mars Attacks, she's in that as well. That I believe that was maybe one of her, if not her last roles. But anyways, uh, I'm a huge fan of her. She was actually in a Hitchcock film that I really quite like. Um, so George Raff, I'm I am not the biggest fan, but he's fine. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is a really interesting uh, gangster film. And um, the first kind of 10 minutes of the movie sort of drills in your head this lecture about crime not paying. And it, it's it's done in a weird kind of like voiceover way where it's like, don't do this, crime doesn't pay. And it's like this weird kind of like, it literally spells out the the sort of, message of the film um but then you know uh it literally does you know talk about like crime not paying in a very literal sense where at the end you know sylvia sydney's character like breaks down in math how crime literally does not pay <laughs> like it's kind of wild but anyways uh yeah the film is interesting um i think and, and uh i think this kind of and i'm not trying to jump ahead of myself but um, I'm going to re be referring back to um, this new um, film noir set because there's this theme of post-prison life for men, particularly in these sets. Um, women, too, because uh, we find out Sylvia Sidney's character is also somebody that's um, been released from prison and she's acclimating to uh, life on the uh, outside. Um, which is, is it, I think that's an interesting angle that these films take because I haven't really seen a lot of older films that deal with, you know, the limits that you have, even though you're free, you still have, um, you're still on parole, you're still, you know, your, your access to things are very limited. Like in the story, Sydney, uh, Sylvia Sydney's character can't marry until her parole is up. Um, and it restricts where you can go, what you can do. You have to maintain a job. I mean, I, th I think like 
I don't know if the marriage thing still applies, but I know with parole, like you have to maintain a certain, you know, standard, you know, you can't uh, convert with other prisoner or former prisoners or whatever. Um, so that's an interesting aspect. I think the movie just is like, um, it's a little corny. I mean, its message is very blunt. Um, and I think maybe if that would have been toned down a little bit, um, it doesn't give the audience credit enough to sort of piece that together themselves. But yeah, just that angle of like what it's like for men and women post prison, I think is a fascinating sort of uh, uh, narrative thread to hang this uh, film on. It's just, it's a little cheesy, it's corny, but I like it. I love Sylvia Sidney. Uh, she's amazing. Y'all should check out more of her movies. Uh, she's such an underrated actor, so. Yeah, uh, the the print looks great. Um, this comes from a new 2K master. Um, this has a, a film commentary uh, track, and that's also really entertaining. Um, if y'all like Fritz Lang and, and you're a completist, uh, I think you kind of need to pick this up. It, it's it's a good one. Yeah, I like those two stars, so I'm interested to check this one out. I'm pretty sure I've discovered Sylvia Sidney, like the younger Sylvia Sydney in more recent years uh, through a bunch of great film noir releases. Right. Um, and I do, I want to recommend a, like a George Raff film uh, from the Warner archive. Uh, Each Dawn I Die is a pretty strong one with J Jimmy Cagney that they put out a couple of years ago. Um, and one thing I also wanted to mention, I was, you talked about the Maltese Falcon uh, last week. I was watching the special features of that over the week. And I saw that initially they had wanted George Raft for that lead role that Bogart ev eventually got, but I gotta say, I'm glad Bogart uh, <laughs> yeah. got that one, but it, it was interesting that was that was where their mind originally was. Um, anyway, <laughs> I'm moving on to my next title. This is from uh, Epic Pictures. This is Woman of the Photographs. Um, this is a Japanese film, um, and uh, it's a pretty solid uh, watch. Uh, there's no uh, uh, reversible cover art. There's just this disc art. Um, so this deals with a kind of a kind of cur like insular uh occasionally misogynistic uh photographer he kind of works at a photography shop where like people come in and ask him to like take pictures and like touch up pictures and all do all kinds of stuff and uh so at the beginning of this film like uh you just see him kind of like working around the shop and just doing seeing what he does for certain people and it really kind of like goes into a lot uh, kind of gives you a clue into how, what this film is pretty much setting up of just like how, people's obsession with like how they appear to the world and like how they kind of tweak that like there's a woman that comes in early on in the movie who wants to set, get a picture taken for like a dating profile so he like takes her picture and then he can like he starts touching it up and then you see her being like okay can you uh can you round my cheeks can you like t like do this like can you give me bigger boobs can you like like shave off this light me up like do like so you see her like kind of focusing on this and this woman actually comes back to the shop several times being like okay i want to i want you to do this so and but then like so that's kind of like an undercurrent but then you he also meets this woman who is like an influencer out in the woods who is in the midst of trying to like film something for like uh one of her channels but she kind of like falls off of a tree and gets hurt and he kind of like aids her and they kind of start getting connected in their own way too and she has like this like it like she gets like this like nasty gash like on her like uh, chest and everything and they start to have like a really interesting dynamic between them themselves and you also kind of see kind of her journey with like how her appearance is because she's trying to like cover up this like gash but then like there's also it kind of goes into almost like some like Cronenberg-esque places where she realizes if she just like reveals her wound, like, it actually makes her more popular and stuff. And it kind of like goes into some weird, like almost psycho psychosexual situations and stuff. I don't want to give away the whole movie, obviously, but this is just like a little taste of kind of the, the themes that you're kind of dealing with. Um, I gotta say, I didn't completely buy the dynamic between the lead photographer character and this like young woman because he's, he seems to be probably, probably in his like 50s, maybe early 60s, probably 50s. I don't want to insult this man. Uh, but this woman is a, quite a bit younger, probably at least a good 20, 25 years younger than him. And the way their dynamic develops, I didn't completely buy it, but I they are kind of both a little bit 
damaged in certain ways, a little bit like off, like away from society in their own different ways. Um, but overall, it's a really compelling movie. And I think it like deals with some really interesting themes. And it's one that I'm very eager to watch again, see if I can like get even more from kind of the text of the movie. But overall, it's a really solid watch. If you if you're a fan of like international cinema, this is one that wasn't on my radar until I saw it was coming to Blu-ray, but it's worth a watch, um, especially if you like Japanese films. Um, so I do have some issues with this Blu-ray release. I will say it does have um, a 16-minute um, interview uh, with the director in like a 10-minute short film. And so the video is good. I think it has a really good video where I'm not as impressed with the audio for two reasons. Um, one of which is this comes with a Dolby digital track instead of DTS, like a lossless soundtrack. And they do a lossy soundtrack. It's not horrible sounding audio. I just always prefer like a full, full body lossless audio track. And I don't know why they didn't put that. The other issue is, and it's more of a distraction for me is, so this is like a Japanese film. There are English subtitles. The English subtitles that are included, the only English subtitles that are included are SDH subtitles, which includes all the descriptions and stuff. So like you'll hear lines of dialogue, but then you'll hear like gentle music playing. Like you'll see like like that text or something or like loud crash or something, which is a little bit distracting. I like to have that like, uh, if I, it's good for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, which is what the SDH subtitles are for. But I like to have a separate track that is just purely text for like who people who are, don't need the, like who can hear the sound effects, but just want to have this translated. So that's kind of that they ha I had a similar with both sides. I had a similar issue with this movie called Midnight, which I covered sometime last year, a while ago. Um, so that is my personal issue with this release. I do want to say that I have contacted the label and like kind of expressed uh, some of these issues. And I hopefully we'll get it to someone who maybe will care. I don't know. But I would just say I'm trying to like help future releases like for like their international films. I especially I think this subtitle issue could like easily be fixed. Um and like lossless audio would be great. But it's still a worthy purchase. I just I just hope that they this is such this label has such great movies. I just wish if they can just like tighten up just a few little issues. I think that'd be a really great label. Um overall it's a good release. Could have been great, but still worth a watch. Woman of the Photographs. It's a really interesting movie. I think you would especially probably like enjoy it. So definitely check it out if you get a chance. Yeah, you said psychosexual, so you had to say <laughs> that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, now, you know, kind of this, uh, my next title kind of like sort of could actually, in fact, seem like it could go with this box set, uh, which is the uh, Film Noir, The Dark Side of Cinema, uh, Volume 12, uh, which is kind of wild that we've had 12 already. I know um, in the next coming months, we're going to get uh, two more volumes, um, which I'm very excited for. So I'm going to um, plow through these pretty quickly. They are really interesting, though. Um, so uh, Undertone is the first film, and uh, this is directed by William Castle, which is really cool. I know he's done some film noirs, and um, I pulled this out. Um, so if you all uh, like William Castle and you want to explore some of his more noirs, um, Mill Creek put out a noir double feature um, of William Castle. Um, so, you know, if you want to take a, a bigger deep dive uh, into his um, noirs, I know he's he's known for his, his uh, horror movies. Um, so yeah, Undertow um, is fine. Um, it's a pretty by the numbers wrong man on the run movie. Um, I will say there are some uh, clever twists uh, that kind of keep you, um, for the most part, mildly engaged. Um, I think where this movie isn't the best is the cast maybe isn't the strongest. And um, I don't think they're as, um, they don't have that kind of charisma to maybe carry some of the weaker uh, story beats but I think it's fine I think uh, again overall it has a really interesting premise um, you know it has some really uh, fantastic noir uh, photography um, and so it looks really nice this release is very solid um, we do 
also get a commentary track. Um, I believe uh, two out of three of these releases uh, have commentary tracks, which is really great. Um, so it's fine. Um, it looks great. Um, this is uh, from a two brand new 2K Master. So uh, I'm always for more William Castle looking great. So that's cool. Um, now, this one might be my favorite out of the set, um, except for there's one element that I don't like, but I'll get into. Uh, and that's Hold Back Tomorrow. And I mean, look at that intense cover. <laughs> yeah. Like there's a lot going on. So um unfortunately this is the only one that doesn't have a commentary track and that's kind of a shame because i think out of all three of these, these this is the easily the most interesting um this is a very weird drama uh, i i think that's just the best con most concise way to put it there's a convicted serial killer that's on death row um they say okay this is your last night you can have anything you want you know make some wishes and we'll try to grant it within reason, you know, like not a pardon, but you know, like basically just about anything else. So he's like, I would like to spend the evening with a lady just for company, you know, maybe dance, whatever. Uh, so that's where uh, Cleo Moore's character comes in. And um, we, we see pretty early on, like in parallel timing that she, um, well, so let me back up. I will say a uh, slight trigger warning. Uh, this talks about uh, suicidal ideation. And if that's triggering, you know, maybe skip skip through this one. There's um, we have timestamps in the description to make that easy for y'all. But um, so, yes, yeah, she uh, attempts suicide. Um, she's fished out of the river and um, she is just literally at the end of her rope um which is a very interesting parallel between john agar's character who's literally facing down the end of the rope literally um so um you know she ends up uh being paid to uh spend time with john agar she um surmises that the money that she makes will be enough for a nice funeral for herself for after when she's when she's finished which is so bleak. This movie is so nihilistic. Mm -hmm. it, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's these very these, these two very broken characters that come together and then they find this sort of shared catharsis and mm -hmm. it's almost like they kind of piece themselves together before the end. And um, I don't want to spoil the ending but uh, I think this is a fascinating movie. I think it's by far the reason to pick up this set, you know, outside of the set just being awesome. And um, yeah, it's, 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 I don't want to spoil the ending. It's, it's fascinating. It, it's, it, it pulls black back some of the bleakness, but it, it really is just a dark kind of seedy movie. Uh, and then finally, Outside the Wall, which is interesting because I think these two can make an interesting double feature. Um, this also talks about a man that is um, released from prison and he's sort of acclimating to life uh, outside the wall, as the title suggests. And it's interesting because right away they kind of hit home for this this guy that he's been in jail so long that it's this almost the outside is like an alien world to him. And right away, like people kind of recognize that he's like an ex-con and it's almost like this sort of scarlet letter that he has to carry around, even though he's done his time. So, um, you know, he's, uh, I don't want to give away anything, but he's sort of lured back into a life of crime. And, and this very directly parallels um, this, this film. So um, it's pretty fascinating. I will say, you know, the story beats maybe could have used, um, a polish um but i think overall it's nicely shot it's interesting i think this this theme about someone's life post prison i think is kind of a fascinating topic um for like the 50s and sort of how we were society societally with with this topic um so yeah this is a really good box set this also has a commentary track um 
gosh, I really wish this did. This is such a good, this is such a good one. Um, but yeah, this is a nice set. Um, this, um, this also, um, all three of these come from a brand new 2K Master. So uh, you always get that great quality with, with Kino. Uh, this is a nice box set. Uh, I'm excited for the new one. Bring it on. Um, very much worth picking up. I'm looking forward to the day where I just have a full wall of all only film noir dark side of cinema sets <laughs> yes. just all from Kino. just 150 sets let's do it all right let's get that uh, <laughs> yes um okay so my next title is from unearth unearthed classics um and this is calamity of snakes um and since you were kind enough to uh uh offer a trigger warning to people before i will say i will offer a trigger warning for animal cruelty uh for the these uh snakes um which i'll kind of get to here in a little bit um so unearth classics they are kind of hit or miss with me some i can kind of tell aren't going to be for me necessarily so i kind of skip out on them because they can be kind of intense um this one i knew would be a rough watch but i knew i could probably handle it and i can uh but it's a very raw animal attack movie um it's it kind of almost directly replicates the plot of ants which we talked about last year from kino classics except this is a chinese horror movie and it involves snakes instead of ants so the it's much more intense um so basically what this is there's some some developers who are developing like this land like they're building on it they come upon a at the beginning of the film they come upon a pit of snakes um and uh it's like probably a couple hundred snakes they say like thousands of snakes i don't know how many a thousand snakes looks like looks like a couple hundred to me but <laughs> um so they decide instead of calling someone to try to like safely remove them they need to get this done quickly so they just decide to kill these snakes so they get like people like 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 uh in this like uh knifing down into the pit with like shovels and knives and like a backhoe and just like crushing these snakes and cutting them up and all this stuff and where this film is kind of infamous is they actually do kill a shitload of snakes in this movie like these are snake actual snakes being killed a lot of the times there are uh some that aren't uh they're like fake snakes in a lot of cases but they do kill a ton of snakes in this movie so like just be aware there's a lot of real snakes like being chopped up like heads chopped off um being skinned uh like there's like a sequence where like there's like a person like at a market like demonstrating like how to skin a snake and i'm pretty positive it's a real snake uh because they killed so many other snakes in this i i don't know why they wouldn't do it this time too um and like squeezing out snake venom and all this stuff so tons of snakes getting killed and of course um they don't kill them all and they start coming back for revenge <laughs> uh, so you see people like in this like building start to get attacked by snakes and they're the developers they start kind of realizing what is happening they have to figure out what to do and all that stuff and then they like kind of go to like this mystical man who they think that can like mystical snake charmer who can possibly tame these snakes it's a journey it's a whole journey <laughs> it's campy at times there's like this there's there's a snake that i know is not real it's like this big puppet snake it's like a king cobra basically or python it's like a huge snake that like kind of like is like the like this huge mammoth snake it's a joy to watch because it is so ridiculous <laughs> like when it goes to like kill people and wrap itself around people it's stupid but it's really fun um it's i i really hate i do hate that they killed so many snakes i think that is awful they should not have done this but the movie is out there is a version, okay, the th interesting thing about this movie is, this release at least, there is a version, it's like the cruelty-free version that you can watch of this movie. It's about 10 minutes shorter than the actual movie. So uh, all I think all the instances where they actually kill real-life snakes have been eliminated. So that shows you how many, if there's 10 minutes worth of snake killing, yeah. you know there's a lot of snake killing in this movie. Um, but there is like that, you do you can see the theatrical version which all with with all of that intact um it's if you like an animal attack movie it's really like 
silly and campy at times. It's really visceral. It's it is entertaining. It's just like horrible the how they got there. Um, and uh, as far as this release, that there, there's also a version in the special features called the uncut version, which I have not watched because I don't know what else they would add. But it's it's in standard definition. Um, but they had that version as well. So I think there's like three versions of this movie on this disc. Um, this, co I don't know the exact source of the transfer, but it's a pretty solid looking transfer, all things considered. Um, there are some like minor blemishes here and there, but overall, um, it looks, it's a really solid transfer. Um, this comes with a, one, like one of the selling points for this release actually is a 77 minute like kind of documentary on chinese horror films like from shaw brothers to like other kind of like chinese horror films um it just chinese horror cinema which is really fascinating because like i don't get to watch as much like chinese horror as like i might want to um but i just seeing a lot of these releases that they talk about and titles i i find it really interesting. i've seen of course some of them through some like the Shaw scope sets from Arrow and everything, but just like it's really interesting to see like this kind of like Chinese horror documentary. It's really great. Um, there's also a 16 minute interview with, I believe it's the director or either that or a historian. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Um, so one of those. Sorry, I do not remember. <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, and it does come with a uh, audio commentary track, which also kind of gives some additional. Um, context of this from some film historians that kind of put some of this into perspective um so pretty solid release all things considered unearthed classics did a really nice job with this it's a tough watch if you do not like if you like cannot stand animal cruelty stay far away there is a cruelty free version but even then i think just knowing might probably be upsetting to you but if you are interested in the film it's a really solid release and it's for as far as animal attack films go pretty entertaining yeah um i know when, when we before we started recording i mentioned that i actually had seen this before like i wasn't i wasn't 100 percent sure until you were like kind of describing the plot and some mm -hmm. of the scenes um but yeah it's it's very uh, intense at times so and i did it, it's funny i did actually hear about the cruelty free uh cut of this film so that's mm -hmm. that's a nice option um i definitely do want to like I think like that documentary sounds like worth the price of admission. Um, mm -hmm. I know um, it's kind of wild that this didn't get more sort of press, but whenever um, on our cinema did, um, uh, gosh, I think it was for the untold story, which is a fantastic category three um, nausea inducing mm -hmm. uh, fest um, that they had a, a really amazing uh, cat three documentary where they even brought back like a lot of these key players to talk about like making these films. And I thought it was fantastic. I thought, I, I don't know if it got like a, any, like, like a Rondo nomination or something, but it was like a, a dynamite feature. So nice. yeah, I, I definitely probably will pick that up eventually. Um, even <laughs> though, yeah, I also agree that the snake killing is very stomach turning. I, it, yeah. it's so funny. I always seem to forget in the original Friday the 13th, they, they kill a black snake, which is wild. Um, yeah. So um, my next title, my actually my my um, next two titles uh, for here on out, we're staying with K uh, Kino. Um, mm -hmm. So we have Steve McQueen and Hell is for Heroes. Mm -hmm. And um, I know we say this a lot, but if you want, uh, so here's the back. Uh, if you want this with the slipcover, uh, you're gonna want to get it uh, soon. Um, this doesn't have any reversible art. Um, so yeah, this is really interesting. I like Don Siegel, uh, his, and his films. Um, uh, I know Kino, uh, pretty recently has, um, done a lot of, of his films. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, so this is, um, really powerful i had never actually seen this one this was um one of his films that i just sort of missed out on but um it's a very stark and, and harrowing meditational war but uh it's not your standard anti-war film and i think 
what makes it really interesting is it kind of focuses on this small, like the injustices and inhumanity of battle, but on a small scale. Like mm -hmm. that's one of this movie's strengths is they um, they make it sort of a microcosm, um, just showing these men and you know, you know, you do see the scope, but I think it it takes it down to a personal level, like a deeply personal kind of uh, level that really makes you invest in these characters and this plot and um i have to say uh i know i covered some steve mcqueen movies not too long ago um this is maybe his best performance i really think that this is like him at his best um i was doing i always try to do a little homework on some of these titles to, to give you all some context apparently steve mcqueen was a nightmare to work with apparently he was kind of in character like his character is very much this like um very stoic very like does things his way um i will also say that this uh film also uses sound in a really compelling way uh indeed the silence is used expertly to both enhance and i think kind of heighten the tension and dread and mm -hmm. like it will purposely stay almost like deadly silent and it just gives you this creeping, unnerving feeling because you know any minute something's going to happen. And then it does. It's like this, you know, build up and release of tension, uh, almost like like a thriller. And, and this isn't a thriller, but like it, it kind of uses some of those uh, similar techniques. So I think that's interesting. Um, this has a um, commentary by Steve Mitchell. Um and um, author Stephen Ray Rubin. Um, now, I don't know um, Mr. Rubin, but I've talked to Steve Mitchell a couple times. He's such a cool person, um, very awesome. Um, their commentary tracks were uh, was really great and I think is, is a big selling point. Um, this comes from a, a 4K scan from the original 35 millimeter camera negatives. And wow, I had to say this is nearly flawless looking it really is um spectacular and again you know uh even with just like not a a um you know um it's not a particularly visually stunning movie but it is just well photographed um i believe the guy that photographed this is like an oscar winner literally so yeah there's a lot of talent uh in front of and behind the camera and this release really does it justice um you know if you're a mcqueen fan uh if you're a fan of this director like this has to be on your shelf this is a plus awesome yeah that sounds really good i've been lucky to like be able to catch up on some of my Stephen mcqueen mm -hmm. blind spots in the past few years but i have not seen this one so especially since I've also caught up on some Don Siegel blind spots. This seems like a perfect release for me. So excited to check that one out. Nice. Yeah. So my final title, uh, I feel like I've been talking a lot about like movies that deserve, need like a rich explanation. Um, and once again, buckle up people. I have another, <laughs> I have another one, but this seems, this is kind of like my, probably my, my standout of the, the discovery of this week. Um, this is from Yellow Bell Pictures and Vinegar Syndrome. This is the Hourglass Sanatorium, which I believe is a Polish film, um, and it is from 1973. Um, and this, uh, as I talk about with a lot of uh, Vinegar Syndrome partner label releases, there is an option of a like a really nice slip cover on the Vinegar Syndrome website exclusively if you want that. You can give it a shot. Um, this just kind of reverses the co colors of this uh, here. Um, but I will link that to uh, uh, in that description. Um, but even just this standard release, I really like quite a bit. Um, and I want to put this in here gently. Okay. Um, and in addition to the double-sided cover art, you have a really substantial booklet here, which is really cool. Uh, most of all, because this is kind of a kind of a difficult movie to interpret sometimes but there's a really nice um uh, essay here that kind of gives some extra context there's actually two essays here uh which gives some extra context um especially the first essay kind of gave me a little extra content of uh, context of like some of the jewish kind of traditions that are kind of woven into this movie which i will kind of uh, i'll get into the what the movie is about 
a little bit here. Um, it is about a man who is like you meet him. He's on a train ride to go visit his father, who is like kind of uh, who's been kind of taken away to this sanatorium, this uh, to kind of uh, recover. Or he's like he's like uh, he's been ailing. He's been sent to this sanatorium. He's going to visit his father. And when you get there, you soon learn that um, th this particular place is not uh, like in our like does not conform by conventional time standards. Um, it is like in a different time time stream, basically, than the rest of the world. So whenever he gets there, his father is dead. But because they are in the sanatorium, he has not yet died. So he kind of goes on this odyssey where he's like, he can potentially like figure out a way that his father will not die, but he's also just trying to kind of like, like basically like confront his father and like kind of come to terms with his potential death and like kind of figure out his own life as well. The best way I can explain this is this seems like it would be the perfect, like, this seems like it could have possibly inspired the work of Terry Gilliam because I see a lot of like the, at least like, especially like, aesthetically and stuff of like stuff like uh, Adventures of Baron Munchausen, Time Bandits, like Brazil, that kind of like really heightened aesthetic where everything on this is specifically on a like made on a set is when I was reading the booklet where the director like took inspirations from a street but he want he didn't want to film on that street he wanted the street replicated on the stage because he wanted everything to have a distinct look and everything that like looked not of this world um so it's just like a series of this this guy guy going through different like hidden chambers and corridors to different like worlds with like dilapidated houses and like different people like speaking like almost like psychobabble and like all kinds of stuff it's like a very trippy fantastical movie and if you're if you're a person that really needs strict a to b narrative this is going to be a kind of tough watch for you because it's a very opaque movie it leaves a lot to interpretation I'm still confused about it. I need to watch it again. Um, but it's a really fascinating movie. And I really enjoy just kind of like living in this world. It has such distinct production design and like some of the themes that they're kind of working with. Like I, I, It's just really compelling. And like I said, if you really, if you're a fan of Terry Gilliam, definitely check this one out. Um, but also it almost kind of has like an Alice in Wonderland feel where it's like this man is just kind of like kind of, tumbling further and further down this like kind of like this crazy world where he goes into like another chamber where like there's like more crazy like kooky characters and it's just like it doesn't necessarily relate directly to the plot but it just is kind of building onto this world of just like what am i experiencing what is time like what is everything it's wild i really really enjoyed it i especially was like wanted to talk to you about it and i want andre if if they have not seen it, our our producer, I want I want both of y'all to watch this movie because it's a really fascinating movie, um, and it, it's like a really really rich movie that I think is like would really reward repeat viewings especially. So I'm glad this was kind of rediscovered because it was not on my radar at all. Um, but this is just like a really cool kooky oddity. I'm not really sure of the provenance of the uh restoration it does look really nice um I, I i can tell this has been like lovingly restored i don't know if it's from a 4k restoration i would assume it is do not know um but it's a really good like uh, transfer the sound is really nice um not too much in the way of special features there's like a 10 minute uh like a uh, piece with a uh college professor who's like talking about this movie and then another 20 minute interview with the like a film historian that gives their kind of interpretation of this movie as well and kind of dig digs into the themes and everything um i wish there was an like audio commentary track but these two like kind of like uh analytical pieces are really nice um and the the booklet is also really good so this is a really cool movie it's a nice discovery hourglass sanatorium it's really trippy it's really fun so highly recommend this from yellow bell pictures and vinegar syndrome yeah no that's interesting when you said it's very terry gilliam like because 
when you were just, I haven't seen it, but when you were describing it, it very much like invoked that. Um, yeah. Yeah. There, um, I was trying to think, I was trying to like just double check if this was a Polish film. Um, but um, um, Vinegar also put out a film that I really wanted to include in my film guide, but at the time it was so hard to find. Um, there was a, a single VHS copy uh available and and it was quite expensive so i it wasn't able to include it it's called now and of course now it has this beautiful new restoration from vinegar but it's called goodbye 20th century which oh okay sounds a little like that in a way where it's just it's very weird and it kind of deals with like time and stuff um so I can link that uh, in the description as well if y'all want to like maybe make it make a weird double feature out of it. Um, and uh, we love Vinegar Syndrome. They are awesome. Uh, I'm such a huge fan. Um, I actually have the homegrown uh, cinema or home, yeah, the um, homegrown horror set coming. I'm so excited. Nice. Um, but um, my final title, I always try to save the best for last and um I think that this is like a gold star release all around. And this is um, Kino Studio Classics uh, release of Serpico on 4K. Mm -hmm. um, so here's the back. We've got a ton of nice features inside. And again, I know we say this at nauseum, but like you want the slipcover, you want to want to order it soon. Um, so um, that's a better shot of the back. Um, and uh, the two discs and uh yeah. Now, have you ever seen this? Yes, I have. It's been a long time, but I, I'm anxious to revisit it. Yeah, this is really nice because kind of like you, it's been a while since I've seen it. And I think I only own like a DVD. <laughs> so <laughs> um, this is a very, this is a movie that's very interesting on a lot of levels, but I think it really kind of encapsulates its, its time very well. Like it's, it's an anti-establishment film it, from the viewpoint of an establishment, you know, like the police force. And, and it's very yeah. interesting because, you know, Pacino kind of has this very cool, like he's a cop, yes. And, you know, um, still very divisive. I was going to say that was kind of controversial back then, but it kind of still is now. But, um, you know, he's able to bring this kind of charm and charisma where, you know, you like him as a, a cop character but you know he's railing against this establishment even though he indeed is you know the establishment um and there really is some like harrowing stuff like like that i kind of maybe forgot about willingly like there's some some very like graphic like um police brutality that's um sadly even more maybe precedent now than it was back in the early 70s um, but yeah, it, it's it's fascinating. Like Pacino is at his very best. Um, I'm a big fan of Sidney Lumet. Um, we just had 12 Angry Men uh, released uh, in 4K from Kino. So this is a great time to be a fan of his films. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe um, we have some maybe more of his films in the, in the pipeline. I feel like um, I heard um probably there's always something bubbling from him he did he's such a prolific director that i'll, I'll look it up while you're uh, talking about this okay um but yeah uh so it, it is really interesting how you know we see you know this real life character kind of come to life with by pacino and again he just effortless effortlessly really makes us on his side and again i think that's fascinating when you consider this was made in 1973 you know, when America was going through a lot, um, you know, we had just come out of um, some pretty brutal stuff with the police with, uh, you know, in the late 60s. Uh, I think maybe this was about the Nixon um, Vietnam Watergate era when this came out. Um, so, yeah, it, it's like I said, it's very interesting how it's very much of its time, but it's very like progressive in a way. Um, there are some cringy things, of course, um, you know, that have not aged particularly well, but um, I think if you're kind of open to taking this journey, um, it's really 
uh, an interesting one. So yeah, um, this film looks fantastic. Um, it's again, not a very visually uh, amazing film, but um, I think the way like the director is able to kind of capture this really grimy, gritty New York uh, in a way that's very palatable to a mainstream audience is um, really good. And I think uh, a lot of nighttime scenes really do benefit from this new uh, 4K master. Like colors look really nice. Um, it's not like HDR to hell. So you do have that nice grainy kind of film look. Um, you know, Kino always does a really good job at, at, at I think, you know getting the film to to look like how it was meant like to have they have that kind of integrity so yeah this looks great sounds great um you know we have a commentary track we have a bunch of um featurettes um i don't know if these featurettes are maybe ported over from another release but i know at least the commentary track is um new to this set um and uh yeah it, it's just it's great um like i said i only had the dvd so i was definitely blown away and very excited to own this in 4k now so uh yeah pick this up 12 angry men uh keep bringing them on um yeah i couldn't find anything definitive about new movies coming out but i would hazard a guess since it's the warner brothers 100th anniversary I be on the lookout for either one or both Dog Day Afternoon or Network on 4K. I would not mm. be surprised to see those pop up yeah. because those are two of like their biggest hits. So hopefully those are coming. Yeah, maybe that's what I was thinking of. But yeah, it, it, it's not official. But yeah, I, I would be very surprised if they didn't, you know, mm -hmm. uh, have one or even both of those titles in the works. So mm -hmm. uh, fingers crossed. Um both are, are amazing labels, so um, either way, in great hands. Um, so, yeah, I guess that kind of covers it. We've talked about undercover cops, snakes. Um, bears everything. on cocaine. <laughs> yeah, bears on cocaine. Yeah, I, it's been a very animal-forward uh, <laughs> uh, segment. Or, um, so, um so as always, um, we're going to do the obligatory, please give us a like, comment, share, all that good stuff. We love hearing from you. We love the comments. Um, again, we really will do a Magic Mike episode if you all want it badly enough. Uh, so, <laughs> um, And uh, as always, thank you for hanging out with us.